bless you to bless our time. Heavenly Father, as we come humbly before thee, you're the fount of every blessing, Lord. We just thank you that you're in control. Things may look dark, but you know what you're doing, then. We just ask that you would take our hands and help us to walk with you through each step. Guide us now as we sing to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for our first hymn. Come thou fount. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 
to think that when we've spent 10,000 years in heaven we've no less days to stay than what we've already had and our weak human frames cannot understand eternity it's a joy to be looking forward to At this time I'd like to welcome Pastor Tim Hagquist to the pulpit and he has a message for us thank you Good morning. Good morning. And Happy New Year. I guess I can wish you Happy New Year. We're, we're moving into uh, 2021, and uh, I hope it's going to be a, a, a great year for us all. Well, we, we certainly live in challenging times, don't we? Uh, and in times like this, I think we look at the desires we have in our own lives, and, and we all have deep desires, don't we? Desires for our family, desires for ourselves, for our community, for our nation. And, and uh, uh, often at, at the first of the year, first part of the year, we think of... Uh, setting our own priorities, setting priorities for the year. And this morning, as, as uh, I talked to you this morning, uh, I'd like to just share from my heart some things the Lord has been laying on my heart. And uh, as a Christian, uh, as a pastor, as a, mission, a former missionary, I think my desire is growing more to uh, walk closely with the Lord, and, and uh, I have that desire to learn how to pray better and uh, to be a person of prayer, to see God use me in any way he sees fit. To see people grow in God's grace and, and knowledge of Him. To finish well. In the past uh, nine months, we have seen much change because of COVID-19 and the political and social turmoil around us. This is really a critical time for our nation, for us as a church. It's impacted all of us, hasn't it? All of us have been impacted. Every church has been impacted uh, by what has happened in the last nine months or so. And in these months, I, I believe uh, the desires that I've shared with you, my desires, uh, have increased, have deepened. I'm an old guy. <laughs> So I'm uh, realizing more and more that this life on, on earth is very short. And I continue to have a, a passion to touch the lives of others with God's uh, good news of Jesus Christ and the abundant life that he, he graciously gives us. And he certainly does, doesn't he? Well, I'm sure many of you have read the book of Acts. And probably many times. I've read that book many times. And I've studied it and I've, I've preached from the book of Acts. And it's always moved me. I love that book. It covers the beginning of the New Testament church. 
uh, a, a period of time of about 30 years from Christ's ascension to Paul's arrival in Rome. And it begins with a handful of very unlikely people, ordinary people. And I think all of us can relate to that. Just ordinary people. Often God uses really ordinary people. And we see Christ commanding his disciples to wait. He told them to wait, and they prayed. He told them to wait for the Holy Spirit, and then Pentecost came. And the Holy Spirit is given to the church. And we see this guy, Peter, a fisherman. He preaches, and 3,000 people are saved. The miraculous becomes the normal. The lame walk again. The blind regain their sight. Those tormented by demons are delivered and lives are transformed by that simple message or, and profound message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world is turned upside down in the first century and that gospel spreads And as we think about that book of Acts and we think about that expansion of the church, the expansion of the kingdom, we have to realize there were no printing presses, no telephones, no radio, no TV, only the Old Testament with very few copies available. No computers, no PowerPoints, No internet, no email, no social media. Can you imagine that? No social media. Yet God was moving in a great way. Great power through these ordinary people. In some ways, the book of Acts, although it... it, it, uh, I'm really moved by it, it also perplexes me. It's about the church, a people redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a body of people where Christ is the head and each person is part of that body, a church that Christ loves. And we see that love then being demonstrated in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament uh, as, as we listen to the Apostle Paul and Peter and James and John and the other leaders of the New, New, New Testament church. A deep love for the body of Christ. And as God's people, we need to love the church, don't we? as messed up as we are at times. We need to love the church. This is the body of Christ, God's people. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, I need to love the church. And we need to realize the church isn't a building or buildings. It's not an organization, is it? It's a people. People who have been redeemed by Jesus Christ, by his blood. The book of Acts in some ways troubles me because of what I see today uh, throughout the church, especially in the West, throughout uh, the United States, Canada. Uh, The culture we live in is highly secularized. It's fragmented with rapidly changing political and economic forces at work. And now with this COVID-19 pandemic, there's a lot of uncertainties concerning the future. And I I think the challenges for many are, are just overwhelming. Isn't that true? Do you feel that? 
Well, I sure do. And then I look at the church in the book of Acts, the early church, and then I, I see in, in many respects, and I've been around a long time, <laughs> the ineffectiveness in the church today to truly be salt and light in, in a very, very dark world. We live in a fallen world. It's a dark world we live in. And it doesn't take us long to figure that out. Uh, just turning on the television and turning to one of the news channels. We live in a dark world. And the big question this morning is, what is the key to understanding the dynamic of the New, New Testament church? What's the bottom line? I, look, I like to look at foundational stuff, bottom line stuff. And, and the last time I was with you, I believe I... I spoke on ultimate priorities, and we looked at, at uh, that one verse in Psalm 138, verse 2. And it says, as he, or God, has exalted above all things his name and his word. The priority we need to set, it was, it's God's priority, and we need to have the same priority. His name and his word. His name reflects his character. His word reveals his character to us, who he is. And, and then it tells us what to do, right? It gives us that hope that we, we can find in, in Jesus Christ. Well, this morning I'd, I'd like to continue uh, talking about priority and uh, the priority of presence. And I'd like you to look at Acts 4.13 this morning. And we'll kind of center what we're talking uh, about from, from this uh, uh, portion of Scripture. One verse. Why don't we read this together from the screen? Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Acts 4.13. The presence of, of, of people we'll talk about first this morning. The impact of people on our lives. And the people we spend time with have, have the greatest influence on our lives. Isn't that right? And we see that all over. Uh, the kids or the, uh, the kids our kids hang out with uh, will impact them, right? And you've seen that for, for bad and for good. Uh, the people we spend time with at work or in school, the, the people we spend time in recreation with, and a, and a big influence, of course, our families. Our spouses and family members impact us greatly. And I think of my own parents. They had a great impact in my, my life. I, I saw in my parents' kindness and, and real faithfulness in the, in the things that they, they did. My mom was the Salvation Army rep in Malacca for, I don't know, maybe 30 years. And she'd get called out in the middle of the night and, and, and help people. And, and that's how she lived. And my dad, too, was a very kind man and, and often helped people. Uh, and my wife. She's a great influence on my life, and I'm thankful for her. And I've had close friends over the years. Uh, a pastor, Rich Thompson, a pastor in California who discipled me after I came to know Christ while I was still in the Navy. Dallas Harvey, a, a retired Navy commander, a Pearl Harbor a survivor that I worked with and he mentored me. 
and there's been others in my life, and you all have people in your life that have really impacted you. And of course, the impact of the church. Uh, in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verses uh, uh, 24 and 25, familiar verses to all of you. It says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day drawing near. It's being together. God wants us to be together, and that impacts all of us. The presence of one another. Being together uh, has a great impact. And choosing who we spend time with is critically important. And uh, the young people, we have a few young people with us this morning, and I challenge you to pick your friends very carefully. And all of us, to look. Look for people that will be, be encouraging to us. People that we can spend time with in the church and pray with and, and learn from one another. Well, the people we spend time with uh, will impact our lives. And then I'd like to look at the biblical importance of presence. Presence. If you turn with me to uh, Exodus chapter 33, verses 7 through 11, this is a profound portion of Scripture. This is, uh, this is right after the Israelites, of course, they, 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 they truly sinned. Moses had been up on that mountain, getting the... the uh, Law from the Lord, the Ten Commandments, and he'd come down and uh, had, uh, created a golden calf and was worshiping the golden calf, calf. And Moses, of course, dealt with that in great anger. And uh, uh, right after that, God uh, gave Moses that... Uh, command to leave Sinai. And then we come to this passage, Exodus 33, verses 7 through 11. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of the cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. And the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each to his uh, tent door. Thus, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses uh, turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. It's a profound portion of Scripture. And I hope you can kind of visualize what's happening here. And Moses and Joshua would be in that tent in the very presence of the Lord. And many believe that that was the pre-incarnate Christ that was in that tent with Moses and Joshua. And it tells us that Moses would speak with the Lord face to face. He was in the presence of the Lord. 
he understood, Moses understood that that presence, being with the Lord was critically important. You think of his, his responsibility as the leader of the nation of Israel. And here he was face to face with the Lord, the creator of the universe, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, in his presence. And then in verse, uh, uh, in verse um, Exodus 30, 33, uh, 12 through 16, we see Moses interceding for the nation of Israel. 33, 12 uh, through 16. Moses, uh, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? Moses was concerned about God's presence. And he's saying to the Lord as he, as, he, as he intercedes for the people, he's saying, Lord, don't take me any further unless you go with me. Your presence is critically important. And, and we look, we look at, at both Moses and, 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 and Joshua, they understood that presence was so critical. And because they had spent time with the Lord and they understood the importance of presence, we, we see uh, that um, they had a great impact. Coming into God's presence, spending time with him. Later on, of course, Joshua was given the responsibility to take the Israelites into the nation, into, into the promised land. Um, and I believe that it was because Joshua had spent time with the Lord in his presence. Does that make sense? in the presence of the Lord. Now we see this importance with Jesus and his disciples. We know as we look through the Gospels that, that Jesus spent uh, much time with his Father in prayer. And then, then Jesus called his disciples so they, that they would be with him. In Mark 3.14 it says this, He appointed twelve, designating them as apostles that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. He chose them so they would be with him. That's presence, isn't it? To be in his presence, to spend time with him. And, and then we look at Jesus' life uh, through the Gospels, and Jesus poured his life into his disciples. They spent about three years with him, and, and uh, they saw his faith, his prayer life, his miracles, his incredible love. Uh, they saw him suffer and die 
on that cross and they saw his resurrection from the dead and his ascension into heaven. Amazing. And it was all based on relationship with him. Being in his presence. And, and it's interesting, and this is kind of a side note, that when Jesus uh, defined eternal life, he, he defined it in terms of relationship. Being in his presence. When we have a relationship with someone, that's what's really important, isn't it? Being in their presence, spending time with them. And Jesus said this, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's knowing him, it's being in his presence. Which, is, which brings us back to the book of Acts. Why the impact? Why the power? And again, it takes us right back to to Acts uh, uh, four thirteen. Yeah. And when they had, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they they perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. They had been with Christ. They had been with them. They were, they were recognized bef because they'd been with the Lord. And God's children will always be recognized if they have been in the presence of Jesus. Uh, there's something, something happens when we spend time with the Lord. Uh, of course, God is always present in our lives if we know him. He lives within our hearts. But those who spend that time in prayer and, and trusting him and looking to him, being with him, they are recognized. And I, I, I have seen that when I was in the military, I saw it. Those uh, sailors who, who, who trusted the Lord, uh, they stuck out because they had been with Jesus. And we, I've seen it in, in the, uh, the uh, work settings over the years. In churches, you'll see that. People who have spent time with the Lord, <clears throat> they will reflect Jesus in some way. And that's because they spend time in his presence. And I'll just share a personal illustration. And I don't know if my wife has even heard this story. Uh, maybe. <laughs> but when I was in the Navy, I was in Vietnam. And, and then we, uh, we were in gunfire support. I was in the Navy. And uh, we'd come back up into the Philippines for repair and uh, R&R uh, uh, &R. and uh, every time we were in, in uh, Subic Bay in the Philippines I would end up on shore patrol I was a senior petty officer and I'd end up being assigned to shore patrol and our, our responsibility was to, to uh, uh, make sure that the sailors didn't get too far out of line and I was usually assigned with a Marine, and our relationship or, or our, our responsibility was to, to, to go into the bars in Alongapo. Now, I was a born-again Christian, a young Christian. I had come to know Christ just before I left for Vietnam. And... and uh, We'd have to go into those bars and, and uh, make our rounds through those bars. And the bars were, were, were often very rowdy, a lot of drink, drinking, and filled with prostitutes. And uh, I, I'm thankful that the Lord protected me in, in a very, very special way. And I'll never forget walking in to a bar, it was early, earlier in the evening, 
there weren't many people in that, that bar. I'm locking in with this Marine, and uh, this Filipina came up to me, and she looked at me, and she said, you're different, aren't you? You're different, aren't you? And I said, yes, I, I'm different. Because I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And for just a, a little bit I shared with her about Jesus Christ. Now, this is an ordinary sailor in uniform. But let me tell you, people... We'll see a difference if we spend time with the Lord. God's children are always recognized when they have spent time in the presence of the Lord. I want to look just for briefly at uh, Revelation. Uh, chapter 3 verses 14 through 22 the church at Laodicea and it fits into what I think I'm saying this morning and of course uh, the Lord is speaking to the churches the various churches in Asia Minor And in 14, the last church that he speaks to. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and the true witnesses, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. And I will spit you out of my mouth because you're neither hot nor cold. For you say I'm rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched and pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may, be, may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and I discipline so be zealous and, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant to him to sit with me on my throne, as I have also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, this is a message to one of the churches. It's really a message to us. And it, it, really, it really relates, I think, to the church right now in the West, in the churches in the United States. He says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot? So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. God doesn't want a lukewarm church. He doesn't want us to be lukewarm people. He goes on to say, for, for you say I'm rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. Uh, that sort of sounds like the church in the West. We, we have been extremely blessed 
And I think the attitude of, of, of many, many churches is that, uh, that uh, we have it all. And, and we can do it ourselves. And we become complacent. And we become lukewarm at the best. What's the answer? What do you think the answer is? And I, I think we see it in, in, in verse 20 of that chapter. In, in this particular verse, uh, uh, Revelation 3.20, this is often used uh, evangelistically. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens that door, I will come in to him and, and dine with him and he with me. That's... It's not an evangelistic verse. It's speaking to the church, a lukewarm church. You've probably seen, and, and you see it on, on, on the screen, uh, one of the depictions, uh, a lot of churches will have this, this picture of Jesus knocking at a door it's kind of interesting as you look at the door on, the, on, on that picture. There's no latch. There's no doorknob on it. And Jesus is saying, Behold, I, I stand at the door and knock. And I believe he's, he's referring to the doors of our hearts. Behold, I stand at the, at the door, the door of your heart, and I... I knock, and if anybody hears my voice and opens that door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. How is that door going to get open? It has to be open from the inside. God's not, not going to kick down the door. Jesus is not going to kick down the door. He wants us to open that door and then he comes in. Jesus wants to sit down at the table with us. Sit across from us and look into our eyes and have a talk with us. He wants us to be in his presence in a special way and to fellowship with him. And that's the answer for being lukewarm. God's presence. God's presence. Well, in conclusion, We've talked about the priority of presence. The impact of God's presence in our lives as individuals and in the context of the local church uh, is, is critically, critically important. Presence. Jesus understood the importance of the presence of his father. He spent a lot of time with him. Moses and Joshua understood this. Jesus' disciples in the early church understood this. Many of those who have gone before us have really understood it. Are the reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, uh, John Wesley, D.L. Moody. They have understood. They understood that... Uh, God's presence was important. And I think this is why the Lord continually beckons us into his presence. And we see this throughout the, uh, throughout the New Testament. Come to me, all who, are, who labor and are heavenly laden, and I will give you rest. He said to the children, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belong to the kingdom of God. Let the children come unto me. And, and we're to be like children. God calls us 
to come unto him, to be in his presence. And then as we pray, we're told in Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verses uh, uh, four or 15 and 16, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We can come boldly before the throne of grace because of what Christ did on the cross. The veil has been rent between the holy place and the holy of holies. And it indicated that now we have access into the very presence of a holy God. It's God's presence that is always with us that gives us hope and peace and purpose and strength in all we need to live to please him, live a life that pleases him. It enables us to be productive because he's present with us. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And throughout scripture, the Lord promises for us, his children, direction and joy and a future. The psalmist said in Psalm 16, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So back to our primary text this morning, Acts 4.13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And I think there's a real challenge for us all. If, if we are to be kingdom people, and if we are to be effective in our, our Christian walk, we need to spend time with the Lord, individually and corporately. I want to really encourage you to spend time with him. Come into, into his presence. And we come into his presence in a special way when we pray. We set aside that time uh, where we can spend time with him and listen to him through his word and by his spirit. Spending time. And uh, remember that call in Revelation 3.20, where he calls us into fellowship with him. But we must open that door. We have to take that step to open the door. And I pray that for you this morning. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've, you've never experienced uh, that forgiveness that comes through, through him, and then that fellowship, with him. Uh, I ask that you really uh, talk to him about your, your uh, need. I talk to one of the leaders in the church here and uh, come uh, trust him as your Lord and Savior. God wants us to understand his presence. It's all about his presence. He's present here with us today. Or two or three are gathered in my name. I'm present, he said. Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for the presence. Thank you that you desire us to be in your presence. Thank you that we're reminded that... Uh, Your presence is, is critical. And we see that in the, the, the life of Moses and uh, Joshua. We see that in the life of Jesus with his own father and with the, the, the disciples. 
And Lord, we pray that we will be people who practice your presence, that we diligently seek you and spend time with you for your glory and for the expansion of your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. think sitting there listening to what you had to say um, I remember being at Bible camp and we were have a bonfire going there in the evening and one little boy that I had been talking with it didn't seem like he really didn't feel that he belonged or that he needed to go to church. And so as we talked, I reached out with the tongs and I pulled a small stick out of the fire and set it there. We continued to talk for a while and pretty soon that stick was flickering a little less, a little less, a little less, and it went out. And I turned to him and I says, what happened? Well, he says, there wasn't any heat to keep it going. So I picked it up, put it back near the fire. There was flame. That's what we need to be, to be in the presence of the Lord. Okay. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Want to rise and sing it together?